quirky British organization, this was it. The statistic was 90.5%. And that statistic has the dubious distinction of being the percentage of all plastics roughly ever made since probably going back to the 30s that have never been recycled. The numbers behind there, so something like 6 billion tons of plastics never recycled. Again, largely why we're here today. So two pretty key statistics that show how much what we're talking about is taking the world by storm. So it should be no surprise, given those statistics, that policymakers are getting pretty impatient. Impatient with us as an industry, and I consider myself part of a global plastics industry, in, in solving these problems. Impatient with us just talking as an industry about recycle, and I'll make my opinions on that clear as we get into this. Taking matters into their own hands, and no more so than just last month, policymakers in Brussels put into place the single-use plastics directive, so-called SUP, which in one foul swoop literally banned these products. Now, it's 18 months before the implementation starts, and then implementation passes to the member states to actually put into effect, and there will be exemptions carved out, carved out for many of the products that our customers make. But the point is, if the industry doesn't solve and address the problems their products are creating more aggressively, this is the kind of thing that will happen. So, I talked a little bit about what's happening on the governmental front. On the non-governmental front, I, don't, I can go through this quickly because Kevin did an excellent job talking earlier about what the Ellen MacArthur Foundation is about and what they're doing. As a member, I'd like to give a sort of member perspective on what they're doing that is so critical because unlike many NGOs or nonprofits, they're not trying to push for legislation and punitive damages. They're creating the business case for change. The business case for basically doing well by doing good. And no, no, no mistake, because they partnered with McKinsey, a global business consultant, there's no surprise that they'd come at it from the business angle. But we believe this is the way to affect change quickly is from a capitalist bent rather than a legislative bent. And nobody's doing it better than the MacArthur Foundation. So their success is, is shown by the, the, the logo slide here. All these brands that have jumped to their cause and, and helped support them and support the projects. And rather than just sit on high and mandate what should happen, as Kevin clarified, they've got projects going on around the world that their members participate in. You can see my company, Little Nature Works, up here as a proud member for three years. We joined because their aims so well match our own. Kevin mentioned the global commitment, some 350 signatories. We were one of the first to sign that because, again, we believe in what they're doing. And our commitment, public commitment to the foundation, was in, in a couple of years, within the space of two years, to move all of our renewable feedstocks to be um, third-party sustainably sourced. All members are asked not to just sign a document, but to make a public commitment and stand behind it, and that was ours. So one of the things that I think I hope Kevin's talk made clear and that we feel very strongly is, is that as much as you have heard speaker after speaker today talk on and on about the need for recycling and what's needed, our feeling is clearly that it's got to be about much more than just recycling. We're not going to recycle way out of the map. The earlier statistics showed you clearly. And I love what, what Kevin said earlier in this session, and I like what uh, um, David, I think, Kimura with uh, Tupperware said, that, again, for them, it's about more than recycle. It's everyday good design. And really, the compelling point for us here that it's, it's about more than recycle, and really, it's about fundamental redesign, rethinking things, and innovation. And that can sound sort of high and mighty and, and rather vague, and what we love about the MacArthur Foundation is they turn that statement into very, very specific guidance. And I'll give you here um, another take on a, on a slide that Kevin showed you earlier. Same statistics. But this talks about the one-third added up 33% of packaging plastics for which recycle is simply not an option. Look at it. If you go through the buckets, up top you've got small foam out materials that are too small to be collected, let alone economically recycled. Next, you've got multi-material packaging that's either too complex to technologically recycle or can't be done economically. Next, you've got uncommon materials, and a couple listed. Kevin talked about these. They're increasingly are shrinking in the market and just not soon won't be out there enough volume to recycle. And last, you've got one of our favorites, which is nutrient, nutrient contaminated. We'll talk more about this. 
So the MacArthur Foundation sort of pointed at a blueprint for change with what was first announced in Davos, Switzerland in 2016, and this followed up in 2017 with real specific guidance. Again, this is more than 30% by weight, 50% numerically of all packaging types, simply can't be recycled to my point that it needs fundamental redesign and innovation. So against that backdrop of what's happening on the governmental front, what's happening on the NGO nonprofit front, what we're seeing is that the whole plastics industry is beginning finally, belatedly, to rethink itself, to check its thinking, really along four major dimensions, to say it very simply. If some of you are familiar with this simple scheme of a radar plot where we can look at more than two things at once. The key four dimensions here the plastics industry is really assessing is, first, what its plastics are made from. Secondly, what their Im the impact of their manufacture is. Thirdly, how they're used, how well they function in use. And finally, to the 9 o'clock position, what happens to them after use? So a simple construct, but using this construct, I'd like to start with what would an ideal material look like, goodness being moving further out in each access. And some folks sort of criticize this and say, well, what good is an ideal? Let's talk about real life. But I think the ideal is a good sort of benchmark you can check yourself against. And to us, the ideal material, very simply, would completely fill the diamond. It would be 100% renewably sourced. It would have zero impact manufacture. It would work perfectly. And as many of our customers often remind us, it would cost almost nothing. And it would be completely recovered. It would fill the diamond. So against that ideal, it's useful, we think, to see well, how do today's plastics, just in broad brush strokes, how do they do? And we would argue that they look like this. Today's plastics, largely commodity plastics, are essentially not renewably sourced at all. They don't extend at all to the 12 o'clock position. There, is, there are many negative externalities from their manufacture, and I'll talk about those using some of the statistics Kevin showed you. The one thing today's plastics do darn well is they work very well, which is why their use is predicted to quadruple by 2050 with all negative consequences of that. And as Kevin's statistics showed globally, they're not really recovered at all. So very much of a one-dimensional play. And the question the industry has begun to ask itself is how can we stretch that one dimension in the other three dimensions, more renewable sourcing, less impact in manufacture, better recovery, and how, how do bioplastics fit? Today, bioplastics manufacturers, and we are one of them, bioplastics manufacturers as an industry have unfortunately given a very simplistic definition of their products. Many of you will have heard it. Bioplastics are materials that are either biodegradable or bio-based, or both. So a two-dimensional play, and they ignore all the other axes here, and that's unfortunate. So now I want to talk today, really, about the other two quadrants here a little bit. Before I do that, though, let me now pause and sort of, maybe I should have done this up front, but tell you who, who we are as a company. So let's hope the video starts better than the rest of the slides. This is roughly a minute, 80 seconds to be exact, on who we are as a company. A little more volume needed. So much for checking it out before, and it worked. Can we have some volume over there, please? Nope. Let me rewind while you guys do that. Okay. We can come back to this perhaps if it doesn't work. So. I'll come back to the background, but what I want to start, do now is instead of, instead of exhaustively walking around the diamond here and talking about every axis, I want to, in the interest of time, do this fairly quickly and talk about sourcing and manufacture. Because it's here that there's a huge externality, and Kevin, Kevin's organization really said it all here, that with the surging consumption, with that quadrupling of plastics globally, these externalities are going to multiply. So. Let's talk about what the externalities are. Let's be very specific. So here I've, I've ranked, caught the major commodity plastics today. And the little told story of these plastics is, is that every kilo of these plastics that's made puts the manufacturer of that plastic, puts into the atmosphere typically almost two times its own weight of CO2. And let me say this explicitly, because I came out of the plastics industry. I'm not here to bash these plastics. I came out of the PET industry. It's fantastic stuff. It makes things look like silk, tire cord bottles. 
good stuff, but there is a consequence of making it. Two kilos, for example, of CO2 into the atmosphere for every kilo of PET made. And Kevin's organization, again, put that in context. If we continue business as usual, that will add up collectively for global plastics to being 15% of the total planet's carbon budget, that budget that's causing global warming, sea rising, and so on. So something has to change. And this is where bioplastics, renewably sourced bioplastics, can fit because they're made, we can get back to that video, we'll show you this, made by transforming CO2 into useful products. So we're by no means yet, are we greenhouse gas neutral with the polymer we make in geo, but closer because we sequester CO2. So in the interest of time now, let me just switch to performance in use because we feel like this is one of the most neglected topics. The assumption is that material bioplastics should be used because they're bio-based, because they're biodegradable. We actually disagree. We think they should be used if and only if they function darn well. And I want to show you some examples here. And although this is a packaging breakout, I want to start by showing you some non-packaging examples to re reinforce the point here that it's a, the bioplastics are about more than just single use. So two examples here. The first, 3D printing, which is really turning the manufacturing industry on its head. With distributed manufacturing, making minimum order quantities of one when it's needed, where it's needed. The material of choice increasingly for 3D printing is our own. Not because it's bio-based, though that might be a nice thing, certainly not because it's composable, but because of these attributes. The biggest being that it doesn't shrink much when it cools, so you get a high resolution print. The second, that it's very sticky, it sticks to itself well, which gives you a strong print, has low odor and low temperature printing. So functionality in use. Another example that I think should resonate, because not everybody has a 3D printer, but pretty much everybody has a refrigerator and probably takes for granted when you open the refrigerator the glossy plastic lining inside. You don't think about what it's made from. It's typically a styrene-based plastic, works pretty well, it's durable, it's strong and tough. But the little told, told sort of secret of refrigeration is that the insulative quality of the refrigerator changes drastically in the first year or two of life. And what's shown here is the energy usage changes significantly during the first couple of years. So there's a lot more energy to run that over its typical life. And for a variety of physical chemical reasons, again, nothing to do with bio-based and nothing to do with biodegradability. The polymers we make in the right grades can make a lining, and we haven't, we're still running these tests, so there's a range of estimated qualities here. But the point is, for a variety of reasons we, get into, we can get into technically, offline if you're curious, this significantly improves the insulation value of the refrigerator, less electricity used, and literally when you magnify that up, refrigerator per household, per country, it means less power plants being built. So again, this is about functionality in use, not necessarily bio-based, and certainly not in this case about degradability. So that said, let's, let's switch in the interest of time, since this is a packaging track, to talk about where, where two things come together. After use considerations, how we do better in this dimension and get better recovery after use and stop things going either to landfill or to our natural environment and functionality in use. And I emphasize this because there is a huge misperception with bioplastics that in order to get this piece after use, for example, compostability, there has to be some sacrifice in use. And that is simply not the case today. So the statistic here, roughly two kilos a day, this is a US statistic, and it's probably because the US is pretty profligate, um, lower in other countries, but it's a significant number, two kilos a day per household, per person, pulled out to the curb, typically at best landfilled, somewhat recovered, recycled, but very little per the MacArthur Foundation's numbers. And especially on the commercial front, restaurants, you get this mess, you get a stream that is mixed organics, mixed plastics, the plastics can't be recycled because they're contaminated, can't be recycled economically, the organics can't be composted because they're contaminated with plastics. So there are solutions for this. And increasingly, most of the major big, big food service where manufacturers, whether they're in paper mills, whether they're thermoformers, or whether they're in injection molders, have now a performance line of compostable products made from our own resin, made from our competitors and industry colleagues. The point here is that this has been around for probably a decade, but innovation is moving it very fast. And I want to give you a specific example of something we're just introducing at China Plus as an example of what's happening on the innovation front in the industry. Here, 
we, have, we are redesigning, rethinking the lining of these uh, paper cups to, make it, to, to really make it best fit with circular economy principles, to design a, a lining that's bio-based and can be either compost cycle because there's a big paper recycling industry out there. So it's not one or the other. We're not here to pick favorites. We're here to design something that works optimally in whatever the local infrastructure is. So to be specific, if we grade the new lining we're introducing against those four dimensions, what we have is something that's very high bio-based content, along with the paper, all renewably sourced. And then in manufacture, it is, this is about a plastic coating that is extruded onto the paper to make it waterproof, oil and grease resistant. It's done so at very high yields, very low wastage, very thin coat weights, which means the paper can be better recycled because there's not a plastic contaminant there. And the other thing is when you make cups, when you cut the board up into shapes and you roll it into a cup, it's got to be done at 300 cups a minute, and we do that quite efficiently too. It's excellent performance in use, that's a given. And finally, as I told you, at the end of life, it's a resource that can be composted or recycled as best fits. Another quick example, in the UK, what goes into that cup? In the UK, it's 60 billion cups of tea every year. The Brits are outraged recently because they've suddenly discovered, as they put it, that there's plastic in their tea. The tea bags, they've kind of taken for granted, are not actually paper, but to perform, they've got typically plastic fibers in them to make, to make the pouch, the bag, whatever it is. We're working with industry leaders like Unilever to rethink that, to make a fully compostable tea bag that gets the tea where it needs to go. And the last example I'll close with here, because I see my time is up, is the single-serve coffee capsule, no, so not so prevalent in Asia, but huge in Europe, huge in North America. And the, the, the swing of the roasters that sell coffee toward this single-serve packaging format, for all the right reasons, because it's a great cup of coffee, has got NGOs, nonprofits, and increasingly legislators very concerned and up in arms that this little plastic, typically plastic capsule is condemning its contents to go to landfill at best. And that's not the way it should be. So this for us is a huge industry opportunity to rethink the coffee capsule from a circular economy perspective. Well, we can now make the cup in a high performance barrier to get one, one year plus shelf life. We can make the lid in compostable and we can make the, the filter inside compostable. Because really, again, this isn't about just designing a package to get the coffee to the consumer. It's about designing a package with a circular economy mindset that gets the coffee where it needs to go through its whole life cycle, which is to the composters. The composters want the nutrient value of the coffee. And this, this will now do it. So this isn't just a theoretical thing. We've worked with some leading roasters in Italy and leaders in the supply chain to introduce, and this is an Italian brand making a, a capsule that's compatible with the Lavazza platform, high pressure, long shelf life, barrier structure that is fully compostable now. So that is now commercial. So I know I'm hard on my time. I guess the video won't run. If we have time, we can maybe bounce back to it. But I'll close there. I've tried to give you a more sort of a provocative look at why we believe it's about far more than just recycling, why it's really rethinking design with new functional materials and using their features wherever they best fit. And they're, they're, they're not for everything. These new materials don't work every place, but where I've shown you, they can work very well. So happy to uh, probably out of time for questions, but I'll, we have a booth outside, and. Uh, Colleagues will be happy to, to answer questions if you can't find me, so thank you.